Athletes testing positive for banned substances is the biggest blight on modern day sport. And in cycling, many of the biggest names have been brought down and served their time. Sometimes they will plead guilty, but other times they will claim that they're innocent and then try and lay the blame elsewhere, like with contamination. But can you really test positive through a contaminated supplement? Because it's like the dog ate my homework excuse of the sporting world, and yet we hear it all the time. And if I'm honest, I'm pretty cynical about what is classed as unintentional doping. And I'm sure you are too. However, there is always that element of doubt. What if the poor pro cyclist is actually telling the truth and they haven't done anything wrong after all? And then just having all these people who didn't know me like attack me and um, just being a sensitive guy and be like, no, no, I'm. That's not me, you know. I had my first beer at age 24, you know. Like, I've never smoked a cigarette, I've never smoked anything. Oh, and just for clarification, the reason this video is labeled an ad is because Science and Sport, one of our partners here at GCN, have helped to make this video possible. Not, and this is really important, because they have influenced or changed the information or the narrative at all. So we're going to try and tackle this question and shed some light on this rather shady area. We've come to the labs of LGC who run the Informed Sport program that analyzes nutrition products for banned substances and then certifies those that meet the requirements of the program. The idea being that if you see the Informed Sport logo, you know that a product has been tested. These guys are the experts. So this is the wet chemistry lab at Inform Sport, and I'm with Sam Kay, who's the program manager here. Now, Sam, I've given a very brief overview of Inform Sport, but not exactly what you do and how you do it. So perhaps you can elaborate on exactly exactly what Inform Sport does. Sure, sure. So we're a globally recognised um, quality assurance program for supplements products. So the certification process is based around two key principles: that of a rigorous manufacturer audit and also the, the testing of the actual product. So the manufacturer order is, uh, is a really essential part of the process because that allows us to, um, to bridge the gap between uh, the standard sort of food certification programs and the stringent requirements in sports anti-doping. Once the, the testing has passed criteria um, and the manufacturer order is complete, that's when we can sign off the product uh, in terms of certification. At that point, we can then list the product on the Enforceport website um, and we can, we can list all the batches that have been tested. Uh, so the athlete can look at the, the product, uh, see that the Trusted by Sport logo is on the, on the packet, um, and then they can check the website to see that the batch is on there. And so how often then do you see banned substances crop up then in the supplements that you test? Yeah, I mean, we, if you look at a, a wider picture really, we've, we've performed uh, a number of surveys over the years, actually, not related to products that we test, so they're not on any particular um, testing program. Um, and whilst the, the figure sort of varies from survey to survey, we typically find around 10% of those supplements that we test um, are found to contain a level of um, banned substance that means they wouldn't, for example, be um, permitted on the Enforced Sport program. And, and what kind of concentration are you looking for then for those I mean, products? Yeah, in, in a lot of cases they're quite low level um, contamination, but in a number of uh, surveys we have found uh, selected products that have had such high levels that, that they would potentially be um, considered a health risk. Um, and actually a couple of products have been removed from the market based on surveys that we've, that we've performed. Wow. Paul is the senior team leader, and so you can take us through the process then of how you test each and every sample that yes, comes into yep, the lab. That's right. Yep. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna do a hypothetical science and sport go energy bar. Go for it. How do we yep. do it? Okay, so the samples will arrive at the laboratory, um, and what happens is when they re are received, we have a dedicated team of people that would inspect those samples, making sure that any seals that are in place are intact. Okay. And if there's any issues with that product, they would then notify the customer. Um, what we then do is we record information such as product name, um, batch number, expiry dates, etc., onto our LIM system. And that system then generates a unique number that is um, placed on that sample and follows that sample throughout its whole life in the laboratory. Now, in this case, I'm quite intrigued to know how you get 
an energy bar into a substance that you can actually test. So what we would do, we would take a good portion of that bar and we would chop it up and then we'd use a mechanical grinder to grind it down into a substance similar such as this. What's the next step of the process then for our sample? So once we've evaporated our sample, we want to reconstitute it into another solvent so that we can then analyse it. What, what we do is we add a known amount of solvent so we know exactly how much we're, we've got in that vial and also then how much we're injecting. So this is a gas chromatography mass spectrometer? That's right, yeah. So what this does, this uses a very, very long, narrow glass tube with which to do the chromatography aspect. Okay. And what do the actual results then from this machine actually look like? In this case here, we can see that this target analyte has uh, eluted from the column at seven minutes. This part of the process isn't automated, presumably? No. So what would happen here is an analyst would come to this instrument, they would take all the data files that are generated, they would then use a piece of software such as this to process those data files and generate um, numerous chromatograms like this. And then literally go through it and say, this one looks suspicious, this one we need further analysis on. Absolutely. So once all the testing's been done, all that data has been reviewed and we're happy that there's no positive findings in there, effectively the sample is considered negative and both analysts are in full agreement that sample is then further reviewed just to make sure that all the tests are completed before a certificate is then generated. Do you ever have those days where you wish you'd paid more attention at school and not ridden your bike so much? I'm having one of those days. My mind is blown. The next step in our journey is to Science in Sport. Ensuring that all of their products are certified BM Form Sport is hugely important to them. So let's have a look to see just how they operate to make sure that they make the mark. And indeed, where they have to be particularly careful to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. And don't say by inviting GCM presenters to make energy bars. Right, so this is Bernard Sullivan, who is the technical manager here at Science and Sport. And as such, I guess, Bernard, it's your role to make sure that there's no chance of any banned substances entering Science and Sport products, and also therefore getting that informed sport tick. So where does the process actually start? Well, the process actually starts with your supply chain. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, before anybody supplies Science and Sport, they must be accredited and certified to a recognised quality management standard. If an athlete was to test positive uh, and then to come to you and say, well, I think it was my Go Energy drink, uh, you were then able to provide them with what? Certificates saying, well, no, look, this is clearly you know, not us, it's been tested. No, that, that's correct. There are certificates of analysis, copies of the test certificates are available, not just to the athlete, they're available to the general public on request. And it doesn't have to be test positive, that anybody at any time, for whatever you've bought, we will send you a copy of that test certificate if required. And then the final piece of the puzzle, I guess, is that they actually then test products that you sell. So, yeah. so how, how does that side of Right, work? well every product that we make is tested at the start of the production run, at the middle of the production run, and at the end of the production run. And only when they've actually assessed the product by mass spectrometry do they send the results through to you and then we're entitled then to release the product for sale. Ensuring that products are free of contaminants is a time-consuming process and we've now seen at both ends of the spectrum the manufacturing side and also the testing side at Inform Sport. But what then about our original question? Is it actually even possible to test positive accidentally? Well, to answer that once and for all, we need to head back to informed sport. Now, given what we've just learned then about the care and the effort that a manufacturer has to go through to ensure that their products are free of contaminants, what is actually the likelihood of an athlete testing positive through accidentally consuming something from a supplement? Is it possible? I, I think there's, there's two sides to that question that I, that I see. I mean, obviously, there's the, there's the high integrity brands who will subscribe to programs such as Inform Sport and testing programs. Um, those brands obviously want to do the right thing in terms of quality, in terms of minimizing the risk of anything getting into the sort of the food chain in relation to banned substances. I'm going to sit here today and say no lab can offer a guarantee that a product is free from banned substances. It's not possible. It's not possible to screen for every single banned substance out there. The WADA list isn't a closed list. But what testing programs do do is offer a, a, a very, very good risk minimization process in terms of providing athletes with 
products that are free from banned substances and giving them the confidence to be able to use those products. Now, what I wouldn't want is for an athlete to be watching this and to then start feeling paranoid about what they were actually ingesting, consuming. Uh, so at what point then do you draw the line between a product that needs to be certified and therefore an athlete can feel comfortable taking and actually something that then constitutes you know normal food that you might pick up at the supermarket mm. and that ordinarily you wouldn't think twice about you know potentially causing a positive test I, I think the key thing is what we don't want to do is go out there and panic or as you say yeah. all individuals out there who are competing or whatever because what we do know is people are having healthy diets they are sort of eating food and, and you say we're not aware of significant doping violations occurring down that route I think interestingly though if you are choosing to choose a supplement product though which is obviously designed to supplement the diet and has obviously been composed in such a manner make sure that you do, do your due diligence check the manufacturer, check that they have appropriate quality control measures in place and do all of your checks and check that it has been part of a testing program uh, to reduce the risk to that end user. Now, before we leave this video, I also wanted to hear a rider's perspective. We heard a clip at the beginning of Tom Zerbel, who is a well-decorated US pro rider, former national time trial champion, in fact, and a man who also fell foul of the rules, testing positive for DHEA, but maintaining that he didn't know how he ingested the substance. Now, what is different in Tom's case compared to many others is that fellow riders have been widely sympathetic to his situation. He was and is fiercely outspoken against doping in sport and his peers genuinely feel that he is innocent of wrongdoing. It was the first season where everything came together I came in with a, you know, a great base. I was working with uh, Dr. Testa, um, and he just had a different way of uh, preparing riders. And um, it was the first season I didn't have a, a big sickness or injury, a big crash. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a good season, and uh, a lot of disappointments in that season. Um, a lot of uh, losing the yellow jersey on the last day, but. Um, um, hindsight it was definitely my strongest season i immediately the first day i got the positive i was like on the phone with vauders i was on the phone with my uh, bissell director from 2009 and you know as many people as i could talk to and um to figure out what was going on and what i should do none of the values really were consistent and yeah i had a problem with that especially coming from a chemistry background and i was working with one of my um, graduate level of uh, professors um, who helped me out, who was also a cyclist. First thing I did was send those off to my buddy at uh, CU Boulder, um, Dr. Phillips, and, and he tested them and um, couldn't find anything. I'm just thinking, you know, maybe these, these levels are so low that um, the techniques used uh, weren't picking them up or, um, you know, it just wasn't homogeneous and, and there was a couple pills here that were contaminated, but the vast majority weren't because I was taking that stuff for, you know, two or three years. We were sponsored by them and I got tested a lot. It was, it was a tough two years. Um, I lost out on two years of, of salary. Um, so that's one thing, you know, monetarily, that was, was probably my two biggest earning years that were coming up and lost that. And then just having all these people who didn't know me, like attack me and um, just being a sensitive guy and be like, no, no, I'm, that's not me, you know? <laughs> I had my first beer at age 24, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I've never smoked a cigarette, I've never smoked anything. <laughs> Now, one of the cruel things about Tom's case is that we as cycling fans don't know, can't know in fact, whether or not he is actually telling the truth. Although personally, I do feel that he is. But ultimately, as harsh that it may be, it does remain the responsibility of the athlete themselves. And it's likely to, until sometime in the future, a better solution to this problem could ultimately be found. Although I wouldn't want anyone watching this video to become paranoid. But I am conscious here that there are lessons to be learned and those lessons are pretty clear. And that you have to know 100% what is going into your body. Because the risks 
are really real, you can indeed test positive through a contaminated supplement. I would like to extend a few words of thanks before leaving this video. Firstly, to Inform Sport for showing us their super cool, albeit mind-blowing lab. To our friends at Science & Sport also for taking us inside their factory and explaining their systems so carefully to us. And then finally, a very big thank you to Tom Zerbel himself because he took the time to explain very honestly and very frankly about a particularly difficult point in his life. And so I do really thank him for his time and his honesty there as well. Now, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up for that. And if you want to watch something else right now, how about Science and Sport letting a GCM presenter loose in their factory, in a controlled environment, I must stress, but making their energy bars. Have a look just down there. <laughs>